these last weeks, we've been reading from the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and today is the last two paragraphs of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus speaking to his disciples. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Pretty much all the way through chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus is saying things that are uh, difficult. He didn't even, he didn't always say pleasant things. You said an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, one of the eyes, the right thing to do is to injure that person that that person injured you. And if someone knocks a tooth out, uh, you ought to knock one of that person's teeth out, that's the right thing to do. All the philosophers before the time of Jesus, when uh, that law was laid down for God's people, uh, it was really designed to limit. But there have been a few times something really nasty to me, and I didn't just want to do that what they did to me. I, I wanted more back to them than they did to me. Uh, anybody else ever have that impulse? Uh, and so the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is you're not supposed to do more to that person than that person did to you. But Jesus is saying, we got to be better than that. My followers need to be better than that. We don't give an eye for an eye. I say to you, don't resist an evil. If somebody slugs you, just turn the other side of your face to get slugged again. Um, mm. Terrible. I mean, really, we know that the way to respond to threats is to be threatening. The way to answer force is with force. And the way to be safe is to deal harshly with anybody who's dealing harshly with you. And you get them back, and then they'll treat you better in the future, maybe. But of course, an awful lot of experience teaches us that once you start a cycle of retaliating for the bad thing that was done to you, 
Where does it ever end? You know, we've, we've seen it in, in all kinds of places. Um, but let's just take Syria, for example, for a long time, for decades and decades, it's one uh, religious group uh, that's kind of dominated Syria, the Alawites. They're a, a, a sort of a, a denomination, you might say, a, a one group within Shiite Islam. And they're a really not a large group, but President Assad comes from that group, and his father, who was president before him, came from that group, and they, they've kind of been in charge. The majority of people in Syria are Sunni Muslims, and uh, for the last several years, they wanted to get rid of their president, and as time has gone on, it's been, we want to get back at those nasty Shiites, at least as they got back at us in the olden to do to them what they did to us and it just the violence just escalates and gets worse and worse and nobody can see a way out the sad thing of course in Syria as in Iraq and a number of other places in the middle of e East is the the Christians are kind of collateral damage um, the, the Christians in Iraq Syria as in Iraq have pretty much been protected the dictator, I suppose, because they're another minority. And uh, anyway, retaliate, get back at them, get back at them, get back at them. We saw this when uh, Yugoslavia was falling apart. It was kind of interesting. There. The Christians remembered the time when that whole part of Europe was ruled by Muslims in the Ottoman Empire and. And they resented all the bad things Muslims did to them. And then it split between, between the Croats who were Roman Catholic and the Serbs who were Orthodox. And each group remembered the time in history, in some cases 700, 800, 900 years back, when those people did a terrible thing to us. Now we get back. And it just goes on and on. Jesus says, no, don't do it that way. Somebody just accept it. Terribly hard, even for an individual. But almost before, if if something bad to you, and you are really focused on how to get back at that person, and you're dwelling on the bad thing that was done to you, and you're fantasizing. That's one part of my fantasy life that's really rich, is the fantasy of how to get back at the person who did something nasty to me. Um, it's like... Who's getting hurt by that? If you refuse to forgive somebody who did a dirty deed to you, you're not actually hurting that person at all. You're just letting that situation occupy your mind, and it's yourself that gets hurt. There's a, uh, nobody knows actually who wrote it, but there was a, a series of sermons on the Gospel of Matthew probably in the 4th century A.D., maybe 5th. And um, whoever it was, brilliant preacher, he said, Christ ordered these things not so much for our enemies as for us. He ordered these things not because these are fit to be loved, but because we are not fit to hate anyone. Perhaps you don't harm him at all by hating him, but you do tear yourself apart. Mm. Way back then, somebody had that thought about harboring hate instead of loving the enemy. Now we read the Sermon on the Mount, it really was addressed to the disciples, to the Christian community, wasn't addressed to 
kings, emperors, wasn't addressed to governments, but it might be applicable to some degree. Back at the height of the, of the Cold War in 1903, White Eisenhower was in April of 53, so I think that was after, um, after, no, no, his Second term, 1960. Didn't yeah. Anyway, he gave a speech in, we, in which he said, "No people on earth as, can be held as a people to be an enemy." Now that was a time when of us are old enough to remember. We really were taught that Russians were our enemies and we should hate them. And he's saying, "You know, we don't like their government." We don't like their system, but let's hate the people. Because he said all humanity shares the common hunger for peace and friendship and justice. And uh, don't, don't let yourself get into hating. Nelson Mandela, who had um, a lot of reasons that he might have hated the rulers of South Africa who had locked him up in prison for decades. Mandela said, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy, then your enemy becomes your partner. Learn to work with your enemy. Whoa, what a concept. Over almost the entire time since I was ordained as a minister in the Presbyterian Church, the Presbyterian Church has been arguing over uh, various issues, really coming out of somewhat different ways of understanding how we ought to be reading the Bible. And um, I could really get caught up in debating and knowing that I was right, and the people who agreed with me were right, and the people who disagreed with me and my friends were wrong. And um, Jesus would say, turning one another into friends and enemies is really missing what Jesus said it's about. Certainly, in any given congregation, there have been times when uh, you in United Presbyterian Church have had very strong disagreements. and had your feelings hurt and been wounded by the way certain things turned out. So how long are you going to hang on to the hurt? When are you going to let that go and decide it's time to move forward? And I think with pretty much all of those things, Pretty near all of you have been working at letting it go, and some of you more easily than others, and some of you have been more wounded than others, and it's more challenging. But to make peace, to be peacemakers, is to listen to what Jesus says. And for our world, God knows there are plenty of places in the world that desperately need a word of peace. And... Some years back, Martin Luther King Jr. said, in the modern world, we're in a situation where we have to love our enemies or else. The chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, has to be broken. I ran on to a quote, and I didn't note down who said it, but... I uh, thought, oh, this is good. Um, and it was in relation to the, uh, what Jesus said about letting go of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and about loving our enemies. What does it mean practically for our world? It means we need a worldwide no enemy campaign. A worldwide no enemy campaign. Wow. Other people do nasty things. That's probably not going to change very much, you know. 
Other people are going to do nasty things. Can I decide I'm not going to call that person an enemy? I'm going to do my best to do the Jesus thing. Now, chapter 5 of Matthew is with rather startling and troubling verse that says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Anybody ever been troubled by that line? Anybody? Anybody thought, oh, isn't, that, isn't that going too far, Jesus? <laughs> Come on. So there are really two things to say about that. And one is that the English word perfect really means, doesn't it? It means without any flaw, without any imperfection, without any even little thing that isn't just lovely. But the word that Matthew wrote in Greek, we don't know what word Jesus used in Aramaic, but probably a lot closer to what the Greek says than what our English word perfect implies. The word that Matthew wrote comes from, um, from a noun, this is an adjective coming from a noun that means the, the end or the purpose or the goal of something. And the adjective then means to be uh, appropriate for, for the purpose or appropriate for the goal rather than to be without any slight flaw. So if the goal is to be a follower of Jesus and to live your life the Jesus way, um, then it's like to be perfect means to be on the road to be in the person Jesus wants you to be. It doesn't mean even that you've arrived there. It means you have that goal and you're moving toward that goal. So I wanted to say that about this, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But the other thing about this is that verse should never be pulled out of its context and looked at all by itself. What is the context in which Jesus said it? So um, back in verses 44 and 45 of this chapter, I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, because God will fall on good people and bad people, shows goodness to nasty people and nice people, and we are to pattern ourselves after God ground ending up with be perfect it's like your heavenly father in um in forgiving in treating others the way you want to be treated now even that reading of the verse make it all that easy at least in my experience it really is not easy to give up resentment to somebody who's treated me wrong. It isn't that easy to pray for somebody who's done me dirt. But God knows. God knows who we are. God knows who he is. He Jesus to live a human life so we could, we could get it. The What God does is get stuff. God wants you and me to be letting go of the resentment, of the anger, of the hatred. God wants you and me to be on a pilgrimage, the goal of which is the peace of God in our own hearts and the peace of God between us and others. So be perfect. Yes, but not in the way that we uh, generally read that word perfect. Our prayer uh, 